Welcome. We are honored to have you join us as we commemorate the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'm Colleen Rodriguez, the CEO of Jewish Family and Community Services. We look forward to sharing with you the Frisch Family Holocaust Memorial Welcome. We are honored to have you join us as we commemorate the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'm Colleen Rodriguez, the CEO of Jewish Family and Community Services. We look forward to sharing with you the Frisch Family Holocaust Memorial Gallery and the words from those of our survivors and their family members. JFCS has had the privilege of serving the entire community for over 100 years. And we do that through our child welfare program, protecting children that have been abused and neglected, by preventing mental health and substance abuse services, through financial assistance and our Max Plot Food Pantry, our school-based programs, and of course, by supporting our survivors and the Jewish community. We serve the entire community. All are welcome through our doors. Today is important. It helps us honor the commitment we've made to our survivors, that we would share the stories of those we lost, of those we still have with us, and to ensure we continue to educate the community about the strength of those impacted by the Holocaust and by sharing some of the horrific acts that took place. We must do our part in making sure history doesn't repeat itself. Never again. A powerful reminder and a promise to survivors that the next generations will do better. By joining us today, you are helping us keep that promise. Thank you. I will now turn our presentation over to Hope McMath, the curator of our gallery. Good morning. Elie Wiesel said, for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. And that is really why we are all gathered here today on this International Holocaust Remembrance Day. 77 years since the liberation of the extermination camps at Auschwitz and Birkenau. And we truly are grateful that you are taking part of your day so that we can all pause and do so together, even though it may be virtually, to mark this very important moment not simply to look back at history, but to also reflect on our own experiences and how we want to shape this world. So on this Holocaust Remembrance Day, we are pausing to remember the six million Jewish people and millions of others who were targeted by the Nazi regime and their collaborators. Let us today linger on the survivors amongst us as well, who bear the legacy of trauma and also incredible resilience. Let us also today vow to, to look straight into the eyes of truth and find strength to push back against the forces that would deny the truth of this history and the forces that continue to wield hate and bigotry against the people that they don't know, they don't understand, and they don't respect. But today we are mostly gathered to remember those who were murdered. And we do so because their lives mattered then and they still matter today. This history tells us that we're actually capable of inflicting terrible horrors upon one another but we are also capable of practicing radical love. And it takes courage to do that. And it takes us being in touch with this history, which we do by reading books and watching films and documentaries, but most importantly, by hearing from the people who actually had the experience during the Holocaust. And that is a great part of what we are going to do today. And as we do, I want us all to answer or to ask ourselves a certain question. 
how will I step into the breach and help to repair the wounds of this world? So we gather today to grieve and remember And one of the ways in which we are going to do that is to um, learn together about some of the details of the Holocaust, but also to breathe in other people's stories. I also will be introducing you in little tiny bits to the content that is in this beautiful space that I find myself located in this morning at Jewish Family Community Services. And to actually introduce us to this space and the most important piece of it, which is the Holocaust Memorial Monument, I am humbled and honored to introduce you to Morris Bendit, a man who is um, a husband, a grandfather, a father, a, uh, a survivor of the Holocaust, and sort of the heartbeat and driving force behind the Holocaust Memorial that is here in Jacksonville. So please, we're gonna take just a few moments to hear from our good friend, Morris Bendit. Hello everybody. Years ago, after my mother went to heaven, I realized that the generation, the Holocaust generation disappearing very, very fast. In no time, there won't be anybody, anyone left to tell about what happened. And we have to tell what happened because history repeats itself. People should know. So I took over and I stopped speaking as much as schools, churches, and, and any, any organization that they asked me to help, I, I did it, speak there. Uh, but then it came to a point after a few years that I realized I'm not going to be here forever either. I want to leave something behind me to continue my mission, to talk about. but something more solid, something that can last longer. And that's why I came up with this. Okay, good friends, we are having some technical problems. So what we are going to do instead is I'm gonna invite Morris to join me in the virtual space for us to have a conversation about the monument that sits here at the center of the gallery at Jewish Family and Community Services. So thank you so much for being patient as we work through a few tech issues, uh, which of course is always one of the, uh, the, the, the challenges as we all continue to move through this time of pandemic and stay connected to one another. Um, So can we ask Morris to unmute and turn on his camera so that we can have a quick conversation? I am. Hi, Morris. Hi, you Um, Thank you so much. And we know that um, we had the wonderful joy of watching you actually walk us through the monument itself. But I wonder if you would be willing to um, tell us a little bit about why you created the monument and the information that it holds. And luckily we have that beautiful image of the monument behind you so people can get a glimpse of it. Well, uh, after, as I mentioned, but it didn't show too good on the video. Uh, After my mother went to heaven, I, uh, I realized that the older gen- the generation from the Holocaust disappearing very fast. And as a matter of fact, I'm among the youngest so far, uh, one of the youngest, I would say, uh, that survived. Um, I realized that 
the story is that our parents and, and, and the survivors that, that were gone, uh, the stories are disappearing very fast. Uh, there's nobody, very shortly, nobody's gonna be here to tell what happened uh, at, at that awful time, which is called the Holocaust. Uh, so I start talking um, in schools, high schools, colleges, and every every organization just asked me to uh, to appear. I I was, and after a few years, I decided I thought, well, I'm not going to be here forever. So I thought to do something to leave something behind me, but something more in solid that will last for uh, many years, hopefully after. Um, so that's when I started working on the Holocaust Memorial. Now that memorial is not a museum, it's a memorial. It's to see what happened. It explains everything in, in, in details. Uh, what I do, the main one that you see over there is a headstone. That headstone is the reason I put out because our people were scattered in mass graves all over Europe without a headstone or even a marker. They were all in, in mass graves, really. Uh, and ashes were scattered all over the place. Uh, so I thought to put a headstone to memorize them. Uh, but you couldn't put all 6 million Jews that vanished on that stone. So what I did, I put uh, a map of Europe that the 21 countries that before World War II, there were 9 million people living in there, and 9 million Jews, I'm sorry, lived in those 21 countries in Europe. Um, well, uh, night after the war, uh, only 3 million remained in Europe. That means 6 million vanished. That includes, if you look on, the, on that monument, on that uh, headstone on the bottom, there's a child's shoe, a uh, pair of shoes. That means one and a half million children were among those six million Jews that vanished. Uh, I had to put this on stone. Uh, and what, what, what it represents also, every country you see over there on the map will show the amount of Jews that were killed in that country. If you put them all, if you add them all together, there's six million. So Morris, can you also share with us the inclusion, why you included the images of the children on the other side of the monument? That to me, I had to show the future, not to look back uh, to remember the past, but not to live it. So I have the future. Those are the descendants of the, of the Holocaust survivors. Uh, they're young children, and their life is all ahead of them. And if you look on the bottom, there is a child, that's a grandchild, crossing out some numbers on the arm of a grandfather. Now, if you add those numbers in the Jewish, in, in the, the Hebrew literature, uh, it will spell Shoah. Shoah means Holocaust. And beyond that, she wrote down never again, and she mean, meant it. Well, Morris, thank you so much. You have created um, this memorial as a way to not just document what has happened in the past, but to provide a gracious space where we can sort of come and connect with that past. And I encourage all who are participating in this today, we hope that as we are hopefully beginning to move, gosh, don't we hope, out of this time of pandemic, 
that you will take some time to come and visit this memorial or any of the memorials in the communities that you are in throughout this country. Um, they provide a very, I think, important service to all of us. They are a gift for us to both remember, to take in the facts and information of that moment. And, you know, one thing you always say, Morris, and you, you alluded to it earlier, is that this is the headstone for all of those who never received that headstone. All of those who are in these anonymous graves um, throughout Europe. And, and, I, and I think it is our responsibility then uh, when these kinds of monuments are built um, to witness them and to become a part of them because it's what sort of continues that, that circle of memorialization, memory, and a commitment to moving forward in a different way and creating that future that your grandchildren have so beautifully articulated. So thank you, Morris, so much. We are all gonna see Morris again in a few minutes because towards the second part of our time together, we are going to hear from a second generation survivor and uh, Morris is gonna join us for a question and answer period at the end of this. So if right now you even have any burning questions for Morris, make sure that you type them in the chat box or put them in the Facebook comment section and we will get to those questions at the end of our time together this morning. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, Morris, thank you so much. As Morris mentioned, um, this is not a museum where this memorial is. It's meant to be a memorial. And yet this memorial is a bit unique and that wrapped around it is a space in which we put together um, exhibitions of art and historic information that helps us put the Holocaust in context and helps us learn new aspects of what led to the horror of the Holocaust, what happened during the Holocaust, and what are the ongoing ripple effects of that time? This is where art and history and information comes together to document the things we need to see, to share the stories of people who are no longer with us, and to create that space where we can bear witness. And right now, I'm standing in a space that provides a brief glimpse of the newest exhibition here within this space. Um, years ago, we did uh, an exhibition about survivors. The year after, we did one about rescuers, the people who stood in solidarity with people whose lives were in danger. We then just took down an exhibition about the unique and incredibly challenging role of women in the Holocaust as they tried to be mother and caretaker, resistor, and friend during one of our darkest periods of human history. Right now, we are about to open an exhibition about the art in the Holocaust. And this show comes to us from Yad Vashem, which is the International Holocaust Center, which is located in Israel. So we don't have the original paintings and drawings here because they don't really let those out of their sights but we do have these beautiful reproductions of 20 important works from that collection, along with the stories of the people who made the art. So in the art that is in here right now, we have images that really speak to what happened as, as, uh, as, as the Nazi regime was coming to rise. Because we have to remember the Holocaust wasn't a moment there was much that led to it, including the marginalization of people for their faith, for their race, for their beliefs, for the work that they did in this world, the rise of Nazism and the attack on Jewish people and others started with an attack on institutions like academic universities, newspapers, there was an attack on truth tellers and artists because the idea was that they could weaken society enough, they could then begin to turn people against one another. So the, although the Nazis were the ones leading this charge to exterminate the Jewish people, they unfortunately did not do it alone. 
They had collaborators throughout Europe and they were able to turn people against one another. And the targeting of people leading up to this large scale genocide took many forms. Many of you know about the yellow stars that Jewish people were required to wear so that they could be marked and identified. Their homes were taken away, their businesses were taken away. They weren't allowed to go to school anymore. They were isolated from others by being forced to live in ghettos. False narratives and bigotry led to the stoking of flames that led to the ultimate genocide in which millions of people died. This exhibition shows art that shows various aspects of that. We have some artists who actually show images of what was happening in the ghettos. Uh, we have one artist who has an incredible piece here, Mr. Haas, uh, Leo Haas, who he's got 25 little scenes of what was happening in the ghetto. What did it mean to live in a place surrounded by barbed wire? What did it look like to take care of children and sick elders when you didn't have medical care? What did it mean to stand in line for food? What did it look like when children were still playing in a place of such incredible deprivation? But then we also have some artists that actually painted beauty. We have an artist who painted a ghetto that actually looks like a French Impressionist painting. It's all color and light and hope and sparkle. And I look at that painting and I think, how can such beauty be made at a time of such destruction? But we know that art and the artists who make it sometimes turn to art as a way to escape the horrors that are happening around them, as a way to hang on to their humanity, as a way to stay connected to the reality of beauty, even when the world is so ugly. And in this exhibition, we have about half the artists survived the Holocaust. They were liberated. They escaped. They made it, but not without scars and wounds, both physical and emotional. But half the artists in this show did not make it. They were murdered or died of deprivation. And it's remarkable that we have those artists' works. And you may wonder, well, how do we? How do we have the paintings and drawings of people who were killed in the concentration camps? Well, sometimes those works of art were smuggled out. Sometimes they were sent to family members. Sometimes they were hidden in the walls of the ghettos and not found until decades later. So this exhibition is about horror and hope. It's about the shadow and the shine. And it is ultimately about this tenacious power that we have as human beings to be creative amidst the destruction. And it's connecting to these kinds of stories that matter. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna introduce you to a second generation survivor in our community, my good friend, Irene Jaffa, who has a powerful story to tell about her mother and her father. It's a complicated story that rolled out over many years and you could say is still having an impact today. But she's gonna give us a small glimpse of what her family's experience was and how it continues to impact her. Because this isn't just a story of the past. It's a story of how it continues to impact all of us today. So can we bring Irene into this virtual space? I know she's already been with us, uh, but now we are going to turn the camera over to her to speak to us. And I do wanna let all of you who are observing with us today, that because we're using different kinds of technology today in different places with different equipment, that sometimes the sound is gonna be high and sometimes the sound is gonna be low. So we're gonna let you make whatever adjustments that you might need to make. So, um, so is Irene ready to join us? She is here. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. 
Um, so I am going to go over to um, another piece of equipment to begin uh, to tee up some images that we will share as Irene begins to speak. And um, Irene, we are just so incredibly grateful that you are here. So if you don't mind introducing yourself um, to the to everyone, and then I will let you know when we're ready to go. Hi, I'm Irene Jaffa, and I'm so thrilled to be here. And I would just like to take one second to thank JFCS for starting the second generation group that they started, which has become an incredible new home for me and I hope all the other members and has created a family that I think we'll have forever. My life, Hi, my life has been shaped by a brave decision my parents made at the beginning of the Holocaust. My mother and father were dating in 1939. She was 21 and he was 28. Living under occupation, my father, Mayer, watched the incredible inhumanity the Germans inflicted on Ludge. A dark cloud of anti-Semitic Nazi power overwhelmed Ludge, the second largest city in Poland, where my parents lived with their families. On November 11th, 1939, during a walk into the city center called the Baluti Market, my father witnessed people being chosen. Chosen because they were Jewish community leaders who were immediately hung by the neck from newly built gallows. There were so many bodies hanging, there was no more space for my father. Instead, he and others were caught and ordered to clean up as a stern warning from Hitler for what was coming for all Jews in Europe. Days later, my father and grandfather were captured by Nazi soldiers as they walked. The soldiers used a large bayonet to roughly cut off my grandfather's beard. They tore the skin off his face. The German soldiers laughed with delight at their new favorite game. They were free to torture any Jew they saw. This was all my father needed to convince my mother Leah to escape to Russia with him as far away from Poland and Hitler as possible. Their families gave quick consent and a marriage was immediately performed. Afterward, they walked toward the Russian controlled Polish city of Bialystok without knowing if they would ever see their families again. Before leaving, their parents gave them parting gifts. For my mother, a small diamond ring and a wristwatch for my father. When my parents first entered the forest, my father asked my mother for her ring. Then he unstrapped his watch. He put them together in one hand and threw them as far away as he was able. As they walked away, my mother held my father's hand so tightly his hand bled. They walked for days, around 203 miles, and to avoid capture, they hid in forests, sometimes without food or rest. As they fled, there was always the possibility that others, even German soldiers, might be hiding in the dark. One particular day, my father left my mother alone behind a bush in the forest for hours as he went looking for food and shelter. He feared she might be found. She feared he might be caught. The war changed my mother into someone with incredible fear and anxiety. It took her many, many years to overcome her anguish to be able to enjoy life again. Eventually, they reached Bialystok and boarded a cattle car train to Russia. The trip lasted 27 days. It was an excruciating trip without seats or regular food, and it ended in the frozen land of Chalabinsk, Siberia. 
There, they lived in a hut with a dirt floor, little food, no electricity, no running water, and not much work available. To survive this brutal lifestyle, my parents worked hard as Russian slave laborers, laying bricks in below zero weather. They only had the clothes that they came with, so the clothes were not proper, not warm enough for the climate. Instead, they wrapped themselves up in rags so they would not freeze. As horrible as life in Siberia was for them, the lack of news from family and friends or the outside world was their greatest misery. Finally, after five whole years in Siberia, they decided to join a battalion, which was organized by the Russians for Polish Jewish immigrants to fight against the Germans back in Poland. From the Russian point of view, if Germans or Jews were killed, either or both would have made the Russians very happy. My parents took the same miserable train ride back. Their true goal was to find and help their families in Poland. Naturally, this was still an extremely dangerous plan for Jews. And that was because the Germans were losing the war, so they were determined to kill every Jewish person they could find. Once off the trains, my parents unexpectedly found my mother's brother, Kajik, who had gone into hiding with his family at the beginning of the war. He was able to help my parents hide also, but first he had to tell them the shocking truth. My, mo my mother's parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, and countless cousins had all been murdered or died from disease or starvation. This inhumanity resulted in the brutal murders of almost 99% of the 2.9 million Polish Jews, including most of my family members. These pictures on the screen are the only pictures I have of my mother's murdered relatives. My mother's brother, Nolik, with his wife, Manya, my mother's baby sister, Adela, and um, my mother's brother's wife, Itka. After hearing the horrible truth from my uncle, my father left my mother with her brother and walked many miles alone to the Ludge Ghetto, where he thought his parents might have spent the war. Sometime, somehow, he made it safely to the ghetto. He discovered his father had had typhus and also such starvation, and he died from these things. His mother, having lived almost the entire length of the war, had been taken, taken to Auschwitz and killed. And this was right before he arrived at the ghetto. In fact, her meager rations of mush were still sitting uneaten in a bowl on a small table. It broke my father's heart forever. He never really recovered from this terrible scene at the Lodge ghetto, always thinking he should have come earlier to save her. After the war, um, I was born in the Lumbertown Displaced Persons Camp, just one of the many DP camps in Germany and Europe. And um, it housed 1,800 homeless young Jewish survivors. And this picture you see on the screen is mothers with their babies in baby carriages. And we believe that my mother is the first one on the left with, with me in that baby carriage, probably my first, all, almost my first baby picture. Um, after, um, after the war, I was born in the Lumber Time Displaced Persons Camp. Okay, I've, excuse me. My parents arrived at the camp like everyone else. Skinny, malnourished, depressed, with rotten teeth, and almost no family. Some of the DP camps arrived in the striped pajamas directly from the concentration camps. 
We lived in the camp for two years. Then we were extremely lucky and permitted to immigrate to the United States. Eventually, we moved to Detroit, Michigan, a place where my father could get work in the automotive industry. My mother found work as a seamstress because sewing had been her hobby since she was a teenager. She was very good at it. My mother, always afraid of the dark, had to sleep with all the lights on in our house. As a very young child, I answered the phone since my mother was uncomfortable, fearing people would not understand her broken English. I also had to go to the door when the bell rang to be able to speak to anyone needing information. My parents never went to my school or spoke to my teachers. When teachers needed help from me and sent notes, my parents couldn't understand them, so they just ignored them. Life was very complicated. My mother was afraid to learn to drive, and my father slept during the days because he worked the night shift. So my mother and I rarely had transportation if we needed to go anywhere. It was difficult. My parents never had much free time for extra activities besides work. They never went to my graduations from grade school, high school, or college. They never went on vacations or to restaurants. And holidays and birthdays just didn't exist for us. Until I was older and could make plans for myself, I stayed home most of the time. Perhaps that is why I learned to keep myself busy without projects I could do alone. Later, I found freedom with my bicycle. I could meet friends at their homes or at the library. Together, we could search the city on foot or by bus. I became very independent. It opened up a whole new world for me. As a father, my dad was not easy to please. He never understood me because I easily became Americanized since I was so young when we arrived. It took my parents many years to adjust to the culture as well as the language. However, they were both very capable and hardworking people. Once my father was able to be fluent in English, he was hired to work at Chrysler Corporation building machinery. This was very important for the success of our family. With age, my father became volatile and depressed, and yet we were unaware that he was developing early onset Alzheimer's disease. Since my parents arrived in this country during the post-war era, post-traumatic stress syndrome was not yet a part of our vocabulary. Since nothing was done about it, most survivors struggled and suffered and did the best they could alone. One winter, there was a huge snowstorm in Detroit. My husband's nephew visited my parents to find they had not gone to the grocery store for more than a week due to the weather. They didn't have enough food to eat in the house. He called me and I immediately flew to Detroit, began the process to sell their home and move them to Jacksonville. My mother was thrilled and loved sunny Florida. My father, he had a much harder time adjusting to the new environment. One evening, my father frightened my mother by pushing her into a glass door. He did not attend, intend to hurt her and he didn't realize what he was doing or how strong he was. I immediately had him evaluated. I was worried he could injure her even if by accident. We moved him to a nursing home where he deteriorated until he didn't know us and couldn't speak anymore. He was there two years before he died at 77 years of age. My father was my mother's hero. He had saved her life. She never forgot. He had been courageous, resourceful, and hardworking. She loved him so much, she endured his depression and aggression for many, many years. I wish I could have known my father before the trauma of the Holocaust. I would have loved the adventurous, fun-loving person my mother described to me. 
When I was young, the complexity of my father's struggles were too profound for me to process. Living in Jacksonville, my mother became a much happier person. She was, so, she was so close to us and at the center of our family. My kids all adored my parents, but it was hard for them to understand my dad's illness. My parents spent lots of time with their three grandchildren and my mother lived long enough to really know and appreciate her, her 10 great grandchildren. How lucky am I as an only child to have so many grandchildren and great grandchildren. My mother completely lost her vision, but rather than ruin her life, it gave her more courage and allowed her hidden talent as a storyteller to develop. She became a popular Holocaust speaker despite her thick accent. People understood what she was saying and why it was so important to tell her family's story. This is a, my favorite picture of my mother and myself. She blossomed into a funny and captivating lady, alive and unafraid. At the nursing home, everyone wanted to be her friend and they all fought for a seat at the dinner table. She lived to be 98 years young. Then as time moved on somehow, suddenly it all became my story to tell and I'm not sure how this happened. When we first arrived by ship in New York, my embarkment card listed me as stateless, a classification to explain the fact that no country wanted me. When I first understood what stateless meant on my card, I was so depressed and I cried. But I was lucky. Others in the DP camps lived for years before they found a country to call home. I had spent my whole life, adult life wondering if I would have the courage to do what my parents did when they left family, home, and country. And I only realize today that I don't have an answer even yet. I think a part of me will always be the homeless, countryless child with parents so different from those of my American friends. Luckily, eventually life worked out for my family. I grew up, went to university, got married, and of course, best of all, had the three amazing children and 10 incredible grandchildren. And you see them on the screen, all the, all the um, great grandchildren. I would like to leave you with something easy to remember. It is hard to relate to a number as large as 6 million. Because it is a number so large, it is difficult to understand its meaning. In the 9-11 terrorist attack, 2,977 innocent people were murdered. Essentially, the Holocaust was like a 9-11 disaster every day, every day for almost six years. I am here today as a child of survivors I live in the United States. I have a home, I have a family, and I'm so grateful to be alive in a country where I can share what happened to my family so it will never happen again. And I'm not stateless. I have lived my whole life with my parents' anguish. This Holocaust did happen, remember. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, I was going to say, we know how hard it is to tell this story, but actually I don't. Um, it's not my story to be able to understand, but it's just such a generous and courageous thing uh, to enter this virtual room. Some are probably friends out there. Some are people you've never met and share something that is just so incredibly personal 
you know, and I think about the fact that your, your mother was this great storyteller as you described her and so committed to sharing her story with others and just how important it is that you have taken that baton and you are moving your history, your family's history forward for others to learn from. So thank you so much, Irene. Thank you. Um, before we open up the question and answer period, I'm gonna pause for just a second and all of us just breathe. We've just taken in a lot. And I think a little silence and some deep breaths and some grounding would be helpful. I can use it. So maybe you can too. So we're now gonna invite Morris sort of in our virtual room so that Irene and Morris are available to all of you for conversation. This is where we bring the rest of you into this day of remembrance. It's important that you've been here sort of bearing witness, but now we want you to be able to ask questions. It is a gift to have people like Morris and Irene in our presence and to be able to tap their wisdom, to deepen our own understanding, um, and to leave this day of remembrance, knowing more, feeling more, and being even more ready to do things differently. So can we bring Morris into the room as well? Is Morris um, with us? He's here. Yes. Yay. Thank you, Morris. Um, so I have some questions that have been asked. And for those of you that haven't yet, type them into the chat box. If you're on Facebook, put them in the comments. We're not gonna have a lot of time for questions, but we'll have a good you know, 10 to 12 minutes for them. And so I am going to um, look at what we've got and pose some questions to Morris and Irene. Um, oh, here's one from one of our students who is with us. We have several student groups who are with us this morning. And thank you so much to all of you and to your teachers for being here. And this student wants to know whether after the time of the war and during the early phases of your life, um, were you ever paranoid that people around you uh, knew what you had been through? Um, did you ever worry about what people would feel about you because of all that had transpired with you and your family? Well, as a child after the war, uh, I didn't experience that because everybody knew what's happening, what happened. So I didn't feel any, any different than, than normally anybody would feel. Irene, is there anything about your time as a young person and having had the Holocaust such a big part of your family's history? We know how it impacted your household um, because you shared that in, in such powerful detail, but was it something that played out with the people around you? Oh, let's unmute you. Hold on, hold on, Irene. I took my cue from my parents. My parents didn't discuss the Holocaust in front of other people. And so I thought it wasn't, you know, and, and I was too young, you know, in the beginning, of course, because uh, when I came to the United States, I was, I was two. So it took years, you know, before I even gave that any thought. But my parents didn't really speak about it until, um, until Spielberg's movie came out when Holocaust survivors as a whole started speaking about it. And until then, it just wasn't something, I don't, I don't know if they were, what they thought, what they thought other people would think if they talked about it at that time. But uh, it just wasn't something for conversation. You know, Irene, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think we sometimes forget that for a lot of Holocaust survivors, they've never shared their story. Um, that, that 
and for you all as second generation survivors, I know in working with all of you, um, many of you talk about the fact that your parents never talked about it. And much of what you learned about your parents' experience in some cases wasn't even shared with you by parents. Sometimes it was shared by others. So I'm so glad you brought that point up. Um, Morris, I have a pair of questions um, specifically for you. First, um, uh, Julia wants to know how old were you when you were liberated? So give us a sense of uh, how old you were when you were um, directly experiencing the time period that we're talking about the Holocaust. Well, I, I was taken from our ghetto to the camps, which was uh, Transnistria. Transnistria is, uh, was uh, the largest killing field in the Holocaust. It was uh, uh, designated to annihilate all the Jews that came there. Um, I was 10 months old when I was taken there by cattle cars. One of the images is on the memorial. You can see one of the cattle cars uh, that took us. There were thousands of them. Uh, and uh, we went through uh, every, every disease you could think of, uh, starvation uh, and, uh, and cold. The cold in the middle of, in the winter, it came down to 40 below zero. Can you imagine how cold that was? And people weren't dressed properly either. So the biggest death was their diseases and cold, beside killing, of course. Um, I don't know how I survived, of course. Uh, I was a child. But uh, anybody asked me if I remember anything from birth. I do not, because I think the brain somehow shuts down in times like that. But at the moment we were liberated, that, from that moment, I remember every detail afterwards. I was four and a half years old when we were liberated by the Russians. Wow, thank you, Morris. Yeah, somebody else asked a question which you've just answered about what thought kind of got you through that time. And you just answered it in a powerful way and I just wanna underscore it. It wasn't actually something that you it was the fact that you you don't remember in some ways now that has sort of you know gotten you through that that itself may have been a coping mechanism at that time right um so uh thank you so much i mean it, it's it's um it's mind-boggling right uh, for our students who are with us actually for all of us to imagine uh somebody who is a three-year-old a four-year-old going through everything that Morris did and coming through that and giving so much to the world, um, the gift of your existence <laughs> uh, and imagining how many people, the 6 million Jews who were killed and all that they could have brought to this world, it's, it's almost too much. It is too much. Um, here is a question, and this has been answered, this has been asked in different ways um, uh, throughout this morning from different people. Um, but the question is, do you, each of you have something that you would like to say, a message to all of us, to the leaders of this world, about how we avoid such tragedies in the future? Some people have asked, do you think such a thing as the Holocaust is possible again? Other people are asking, what is your message to the world based on your experiences that you want all of us to carry with us today? So I'm gonna start with you, Morris, and then go to Irene. Uh, as I mentioned before, history always repeats itself. Doesn't matter if it's a thousand years or 75 years. Uh, we got to be alert. And, uh, what, what I believe is, as a matter of fact, at this moment, there's a higher, a bigger anti-Semitism going around in the world than before World War II. That is scary. I believe uh, the deniers are, are the cause of that, and they're the and, and, and another thing, the deniers 
uh, today, today, especially with all the technology, to re to see uh, all the movie. I mean, the reels of 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 movies and pictures that the Germans. I'm talking about the Nazis. Proudly, they took, and there are in the thousands of them. Uh, so, in today's technology, to 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 say it didn't happen. Now, I believe those deniers do know what happened, but they hate the Jews so much, they will deny others to believe it happened. Thank you. Yeah, Morris, you're speaking right at the heart of why education around this is so important and why moments for all of us to gather and share are so critical. I know I have personally had an experience in this gallery where I was teaching a group of university students and one reacted very emotionally. And it turned out she was living in a home with parents who were Holocaust deniers. And it was being in this space and hearing from you and seeing the monument that she all of a sudden, right there in the moment, recognized that it was true, that she had been told something very false for most of her life. So thank you, Morris, so much. Irene, what about you? What is, what is your sense of, of why this matters that we talk about this today? And so your message to each of us um, and to the world at large about how we avoid such things in the future. Make sure you unmute yourself. I can only do in life what I can do for myself. And, and, and I feel like by speaking about the Holocaust, I'm doing a very, very small part to educate people. And education is, is a huge, huge part of it. Um, you know, if you get educated and, and you learn about the Holocaust for the first time, you know, pass it on. You know, if, if each person would pass it on, that, that would, who knows what, what kind of an effect that would have. Um, as far as fear for the future, yes, I, I am afraid because of, you know, reading the newspaper every day and seeing what's going on. I, I am, I'm afraid for my children and my grandchildren, maybe not so much for myself anymore, but, um, mm -hmm. I, I do worry, and um, but you have to you have to hope that things will will get better, and you have to be positive, and that's another thing that I think is important. Yeah. Trying to live a very positive life about the future. Gosh, I I agree. I mean, there's something so so hard and heavy about all this, and I know everybody who's with us today is feeling that, and yet, you know, we must hope. And, and hope itself to hope, <laughs> to, to commit to reimagining a different future and to play a small role in repairing this world is important. Uh, and you all are sort of uh, helping us become accountable partners in that work. So you are setting the kind of positive example that we all need, where we need to look truth in the eyes no matter how ugly and yet turn that into fuel for fire for doing right and doing good so with that what we are going to do is we are going to wrap our time together in a very special way we know that today is a time for us to remember it is a day to not just learn the way we have learned but to mourn and grieve to mourn and grieve for Morris's family, for Irene's family, for all the families who lost too many people to too much hate. So for the next two minutes, we are gonna sit silently together and I ask everybody to stay with us because we are gonna go through the sacred act of looking at just a few of the names of people who were taken from us during the Holocaust. These are names that were shared with us from people who are close to Jewish Family Community Services, people who are part of our survivor community here in Jacksonville. 
And at the very end of that brief showing of names, we will have just a couple of quick closing remarks to send us out into the world in a way in which we can do the kind of good that Morris and Irene have charged us with. So today we mourn those who were brutally murdered because their existence mattered, their absence matters. We also have taken in lessons around the possibility of hate, but also the potential of love to not slip into oblivion. Today is also a day to express gratitude. And my deepest gratitude in this moment goes to our good friends, Morris and Irene, for so courageously sharing stories that are hard to share and harder to know ever existed. And let me leave us all with this. This is our collective work to reckon, to remember, and to reimagine. And no one said it best, better than Ilel Wiesel. This fiery memory remains and we, you and I, all of us are now its privileged custodians. So now that we have heard all of this, let us do good with it. And we hope you will stay engaged with Jewish Family Community Services, continue to advocate for creating such spaces in our community, and please take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let us move into the world from a place of love. Be well, and thank you so much for your presence on this important day.